Let's pray together. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time that we can engage in studying it, meditating upon it. And in these moments together as we do so, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our thoughts and guide our hearts and better help us to understand uh, what these passages are saying and what are your expectations for us and what are your promises for us. And we pray that you would give us an even greater desire to spend time in your word, to understand it, to live by it. Lord, as we do so, may we grow and may we be more like Jesus every day. In his name we do pray. Amen. Let me ask you what I consider to be a pretty important question. Does it matter, does it really matter what a person believes? Can what you believe impact the lives of other people? Does it matter? If I believe that I was born from a turnip patch, does that affect how I live my life? Or if I believe that, that God created me, does that affect my life? Does what I believe matter? I hope that you'll agree with me that it absolutely matters. Uh, consider Saeed Katu, or Kutab, I'm not sure how to say it, but you'll bear with me because I bet you don't know how to say it either. So, uh, Saeed Kutab, uh, probably never heard of him, maybe somehow. Uh, even though he died more than 50 years ago, Saeed Kutab has a profound impact on each of our lives every single day, still today. <coughs> on your family, on your job, on your travel, on your future, on your, your finances, on your outlook in this world. How did he do that? Well, Say Saeed Kutab was an Egyptian radical politician. He was actually a fascist. He was on the same pages as Hitler, read many of the same books as, had, as Hitler, and had much of the same attitude as Hitler. Uh, he developed a worldview of hatred and violence and attack. He hated the Jews. He hated Christians. He despised the West. And in his, in his understanding, they should attack uh, Christians and Jews and the West at all possible opportunities. Uh, it was a, a, a worldview of hatred. Well, he was so dangerous that the Egyptian government actually put him in jail in the 1960s. But even in jail, he continued to spread his worldview uh, of hatred and violence and, and of, of terror. Well, eventually the Egyptian government put him to death. And you would have thought that would have been the end of him, <laughs> except that he... Uh, passed along his views to his brother Muhammad Qutab, who then took those teachings to a university in Saudi Arabia. Like I said, you probably never heard of either one of them, but I bet you have heard of their star pupil, Osama bin Laden, who took uh, their teachings, who took their worldview, and turned it into the foundations of his own terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda. Raise your hand if you've heard anything in the news about Al-Qaeda in the past week. We're still impacted by this one man's hatred and violence and his thoughts on how to deal with that in society. Uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, even though he was killed, his organization continues today uh, with the same worldview of hatred and violence and attack. And so that is the power of what somebody believes. That's the power of just one man's belief that spread and spread and spread. You may not realize it, but every single day you are impacted by the worldviews of the people around you. Whether it's your family, whether it's your co-workers, whether it's a teacher, whether it's here at the church, wherever you go, you are impacted by the, the worldviews uh, of the people <laughs> around you. Now, even people you don't know, even people you don't realize that you're communicating with, even people on TV, even stars, even uh, associates at, at Walmart or wherever you may be, we're impacted by other people's worldviews. And so, does it really matter what a person believes? Is it important to me 
what I believe? Is it important to me what you believe? Absolutely. It makes a huge difference in not only our lives, but in the lives of the people around us. Today I want to just look at the question and, and answer the question, what is a worldview? What is a worldview all about? Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Church in California explains it well. He writes, your worldview is the belief that you build your life on. It's how you view everything in life. It's how you view God. It's how you view yourself. It's how you view other people. It's how you view Satan. Your worldview includes your thoughts about life and about death, about the past, about the present, and the future. Your worldview includes what you feel about pain and about suffering, about problems, what you think about good and evil. Your worldview includes what you think about relationships, about time, and about money. Everything you think about life is included in what is called your worldview. It's literally all the ideas, all the experiences, all the images, all the beliefs, all the convictions, the concepts, the standards, the principles, and all the hurts and everything. And the truth is, everybody, whether you've taken time to intentionally develop it or not, has a worldview. Everybody has one. Uh, perhaps you remember uh, one of the worldviews in Forrest Gump. You remember the movie Forrest Gump? What was one of the things that he said and, and while he was sitting on the bench telling his story? Now somebody can do a better impression than that, right? There we go. Life is like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. That's a worldview. Perhaps you've heard people say, life is a party. Maybe you lived by that philosophy when you were in college or high school. Life is a party. That's a worldview. Life is a contest. Life is a race. Life is a circus. Life is, you fill in the blank, and that's a good chance that that's your worldview or part of your worldview. The way you view life is a large part of it. God wired our brains in such a way that every time we go to make a decision, our minds instantaneously access all the data that's ever been put in there. And just we don't even intentionally do it, it just automatically happens. It, it processes all your feelings, all your experiences, all your knowledge, all your beliefs, everything before it makes, before you make a decision. And ask yourself, now what do I believe about this? And then subconsciously, you base that decision on what you believe to be true, based on your experience, based on your knowledge, based on your faith. And your worldview greatly impacts all your decisions, all your choices, all your priorities, all your commitments, your goals, your convictions, your hopes, your standards, and your relationships. So over the next several weeks, we're going to spend some, try, some time trying to clarify our own worldviews. Now, why is it important to do that? Because without even recognizing it, if we don't purposefully and thoughtfully do so and, and look at it ourselves, we may be operating on an outdated, on a, on a, a faulty or on a false worldview or on a worldly worldview when we're called to live by a biblical Christian worldview instead. So it would be helpful for us over the next little several weeks to evaluate what is it that I believe and why? And how does that jive with what the Bible teaches? And am I living by a biblical worldview or something else? By a worldly worldview or something in between? It's important that we understand that. A recent survey I find this just extremely scary, and I hope that it's wrong, but a recent survey showed that only 4% of, 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 adults, of adults in America use a biblical worldview for, as a basis for making their decisions. In other words, their morality is based on something other than the Bible. And what they make their, their decisions on are based on some other standard besides the plumb line of God's Word. Only 4% of adults in America uh, use a biblical worldview, according to the survey. Uh, more shocking, 
was the discovery that even among the religious people that answered the survey, only 9% of born-again Christians said that they make their moral choices based on the Bible. Man, if that's true, there's no wonder this world is as lost as it is. We're not being the salt or the light of the earth if we're not even basing our decisions on the Bible. I don't know about you. I hope that those aren't true for you, and I really hope they're not true for me as well. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, wants us and enables us to follow and live by His worldview. That means to think about life as He sees it, to believe the truths that He has presented to us about the world in which we live about our own lives, of where we've come from, where we're going, as, as I said earlier. He wants us to, to live by His <coughs> worldview. Jesus promised, when the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. Uh, who better to tell us about reality than the one who made it all? than the one who created it, the one who thought it and said it and it was, the one who holds it all together with his infinite wisdom and power and love. Should we not turn to him first if we want to get a better understanding of the world around us? And that verse, uh, we're promised that the Holy Spirit who indwells us as believers helps us to have God's perspective on life, on, on, on the world, on everything. And the Apostle Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16, he said, We have not received the spirit of this world, but rather the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man, however, makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. And this is the, the, the part of the passage I want you to remember. But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. The Holy Spirit has given us his infinite and eternal uh, wisdom to help us understand the world around us and how life works. And then on top of that, on top of the Holy Spirit working inside of us, God has also given us the Bible to help us conform our finite ways of thinking to, to match His eternal perspective. Jesus prayed for us. He said, God, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17. So if you want uh, an accurate and living worldview, we have to go to the Bible. You know, where God uses the Bible to sanctify our lives. So how about you? You don't have to give me any kind of indication, but I want you to think about it in your heart and search your heart. How about you? Can you say that you consistently live by the truths of the Bible? Can you say that you have a biblical worldview? Can you say that with the Holy Spirit's help, you indeed have the mind of Christ? Uh, the, probably we're all somewhere on a long spectrum of how true those statements are. Some of us have been believers for longer. Some of us are more mature in our, our faith. Some of us are more mature in our understanding. Some of us have just begun. So we're all over the spectrum uh, of where that is true in our lives. But here is the good news. Ultimately, worldview is a choice. Nobody, not even God, forces you to believe anything. God created you in His image and gave you the free will to choose what you want to believe. And He even lets you believe stupid stuff, uh, whether you want to do that or not. Uh, stuff that makes no sense whatsoever, stuff that has been proven to be 
be false, uh, stuff that's been proven to be dangerous, doesn't matter. He lets you have your free will to choose what you want to believe. But if your beliefs are making you miserable, or if your beliefs just aren't working out in your life, or if your beliefs uh, are not consistent uh, with the Word of God, with God's worldview, here's the good news. You can change them. You can grow. You can learn. You can, you can trans, be transformed to understand God's worldview. The Apostle Paul challenged. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans 12, verse 2. As Christians, we must daily let God renew our minds so that we can think like He thinks, so that we can see life as God sees life, so that we can have His worldview. Now the truth is, there's probably an infinite amount of worldviews out there in this world that are vying for our attention and vying for our beliefs. Uh, I'd like for us to look at seven uh, this morning, just briefly, seven worldviews that are common here in American culture. Uh, we're constantly bombarded by these ideas, and if we're honest, I bet we all would have to admit that at times we ourselves have engaged in some of this kind of thinking. The first worldview says... The one with the most toys wins. That view can be summarized with the simple words, a simple phrase, more, more, more. It's the world view of materialism. Materialism says that the only thing that really matters in life is the acquisition of things, of stuff. It tells us that if we have more, then we are worth more. Jesus challenged the materialist worldview. He said in Luke 12, 5, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And Jesus knew that possessions can never truly satisfy. So don't judge the value of your life based on how much or how little you have. Materialism does not work in the end. The second worldview says, I've got to think about me first. Is the worldview of individualism. From the time we're very little, we're taught to think it's all about me. Uh, manufacturers make billions and billions of dollars every year advertising with commercials and slogans that feed our sense of selfish entitlement. Have it your way. We do this for you. Have it your way. It's a totally self-centered way of life. And it basically says, we may not say it with our mouths, but the, the, the lifestyle says it. I don't really care about the community. I don't really care about other people. All I care about is me and doing what's best for me. Jesus challenged the individualist worldview. He says in Matthew 16, 25, if you try to keep life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. According to Jesus, our significance in life does not come from serving ourselves, but rather from serving God, from focusing on God and focusing on other people. The third worldview I'd like to mention says, do whatever feels good, have fun, live for pleasure. This worldview is called hedonism. Hedonism says that the most important thing in life is how I feel. The goal is to do whatever makes me feel good, makes me feel happy. Uh, your feelings become the judge of everything. The Bible challenges the hedonist worldview. We read in Proverbs 21, 17, Are you addicted to thrills? What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. According to God's word, Pleasure is not actually the goal in life. <coughs> However, we can have moments of pleasure as we seek a relationship with God and try to live a godly life. In the end, the worldly pursuit of pleasure never fully satisfies. The next worldview says, 
Whatever works for me, I'm going to do. Or whatever works for you, go for it. This worldview is called pragmatism. It says uh, that it really doesn't matter if something's right or wrong. It doesn't acknowledge right or wrong. It really doesn't matter if it hurts somebody else in the, in the wake of doing it. It worked as, it's okay to do it as long as it's good for me. It's a popular view in our pluralistic world. According to our society today, we see it on the news all the time, especially when uh, some Christian tries to, to voice an opinion about right or wrong in the world. Uh, we see that the only thing that's wrong in our society today is to tell somebody else that he or she is wrong in the way that they're living or what they're doing. To, to point out sin is, is the only thing that's wrong in our world. That's, pretty, that's a pretty clever script. <laughs> that's a pretty clever strategy of the devil, of the enemy, who understands that we have to acknowledge our sin in order to recognize our need for a Savior. If there's no sin, if there's nothing wrong, then I'll never turn to Jesus. <laughs> And so our society is pretty good today at telling us there's nothing wrong except you telling me that I'm wrong. Amen? You've seen that? Amen. Amen? Amen? This view says that tolerance and acceptance is the key. Even if you don't agree with me, even if you don't like what I'm doing, even if you think it's wrong, even if you think it's dangerous, just mind your own business and let me do whatever I want to do. There's a problem with that thought, however. There are things that may work for people but are still nevertheless wrong. There's right and wrong in this world. There's good and bad in this world. It worked for Hitler. It was good for him to try to annihilate the Jewish population in Germany. He was happy with that. It was evil. It was wicked. It was bad. There are, there are things out there that are bad for society. Things out there that are bad for the individuals that are doing them. Things out there that, that even though they're doing it, is bad for us in general. There's right and wrong. And the Bible challenges the, pragmati the pragmatic worldview. We read in Proverbs 14, 12, There's a way that seems right for a man, but in the end it leads to death. So whether people want to acknowledge right or wrong or good or bad or sin, it doesn't matter if they accept it or not. It is what it is, and they will face the consequences for their choices and, and what they do. It's just, it's just the truth, the principle that God has set in motion. The fifth worldview says God doesn't really exist. This worldview is called naturalism. It goes hand in hand with both the theory of evolution and the philosophy or the, or the religion, if you will, of atheism. It says, I believe that everything in life is just the result of random chance. We're all accidents of nature. There is no grand creator. There is no grand design. There is no God. People are just educated slime. The human race is just one more animal species, no better than dogs or cows or rats. Naturalism. Evolution. Atheism. Now I want you to listen to the logical, the, the, the logical rational conclusion of that philosophy. And this is big. If God doesn't exist, then you don't matter. If God doesn't exist, you're nothing. You're not even, you don't even get human status. You're just an animal. You're just an accident. And the truth is, if you're just an accident and you're just an animal, then I can sit here and blow your head off and so what? Doesn't mean anything to anybody. You're nothing. That's the, the logical conclusion of naturalism. If there is no plan, if there is no purpose, if there is no design in life, then your life does not matter. It has no value. The truth is that your value comes from the fact that you were created on purpose by a loving God who knew what he was doing and did it on purpose. Here's what I don't understand. 
through the years, and maybe not even so much now, but through the years, we as Americans have always condemned and judged countries like the Soviet Union and China and others for being godless nations that persecute religion and demand atheism within their borders. And yet, we turn the other way and either fail or refuse to acknowledge that every day in our own schools, our own children are being forced to learn the same godless tenets of naturalism and atheism that we so vehemently condemn in other countries. While refusing to even acknowledge creation at all. Which basically says God is not even an option in this textbook. Not even an option in the scientific world. Wake up. From kindergarten on, our children are being taught in the schools that there is no creator God. But that everything, including people, evolved accidentally from a pool of slime. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the days ahead. Uh, I hope that you can see a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit passionate about the subject. Yeah. The Bible challenges the naturalist worldview. The Apostle Paul said, From the beginning of creation, God has shown what he is like by all that he's made. That's why those people don't have any excuse. They know about God, but they don't honor him or even thank him. They claim to be wise, but they are fools. Romans 1, 20 to 22. In other words, we look at nature... We look at the beautiful ocean out here. We look at trees. We look at our, our bodies. We look at the mountains. We look at whatever God has made. And we can get some understanding of what God is like. When we look at creation, we see that, that God is, is creative. We see that He's powerful. We see that, that He is organized. The Bible warns. The fool says in his heart... There is no God. Psalm 14, 1. By us not contending with the theory of evolution being taught in public schools, or God forbid, accepting it for ourselves, we are letting our kids be taught, and maybe we ourselves are following the way of fools. That there is no God. So we'll talk about that in the days ahead. The sixth worldview says, You're your own God. I'm God. This worldview was called humanism. The truth is that if we don't worship God, we were just wired in such a way to worship something. We're going to find something else to worship. We may not even call it worship, but our love, our attention, our devotion, our commitment, our, our, our sacrifice, our commitment is going to be to something else besides God. Oftentimes, it's ourselves. Uh, this worldview says, I am the master of my fate. I am in charge. I am the center of the universe. I am God. That was the original temptation in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? You'll be like God. You'll know right from wrong. You'll be God. Eat this and you'll be God. The truth is this. Now, this may be a surprise for some of you. Some of you, I hope not. You're not God. <laughs> You're not God. <coughs> if you are God, if you're God, if you're the God even in your own life, if you're God, then why can't you even solve your own problems? And then turn around and solve mine too. You can't because you're not God. While you're at it, solve the world's problem. Solve the, the, the human trafficking problem. Solve the drug problem. Solve the crime problem. Solve whatever is out there. You can't. It's bigger than you. It's a reminder that it's bigger than you. The Bible challenges the humanist worldview. Paul said, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped created things rather than the creator. Romans 1, 25. The people who think the world revolves around them are, are living a lie. They may not know it, but they're, they're in a dream world. 
And then finally, there's the worldview that the Bible talks about. It says, God made me for his purposes. God created me on purpose. And this worldview is called theism. And Paul said, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything, God started in him and finds its purpose in him. Colossians 1, 16. Absolutely everything was created by God and for God, for a purpose. That's the worldview God wants you to have. That's the worldview that's presented in the Bible. That's the worldview that brings you life. He sent his son Jesus and he gave us the Bible to show us his view of reality. And that's pretty special that God has given us his view of life. The one who, who was there when there wasn't anything else. The one who was there when there were no mountains, there was no oceans, there were no animals, there were no people. He set it all in the motion. He put it into place and he shares with us his view. There are two common myths about what you believe. The first one is the sincerity myth, which goes like this. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. There's only one problem with that. You can be sincere and you can be wrong at the same time. The pilot who sincerely thought he was higher than he was still crashes into the side of the mountain. Doesn't matter how sincerely he believes it, the truth proves otherwise. There's also uh, a second myth, the, the situational myth which says it doesn't really matter what you believe this time because it depends on your circumstances. You can believe one thing this time and one thing the next time and one thing the next time. It doesn't matter. If you've ever tried to do that, you know that your life is chaos. You have to admit that your life is lost because there's no order there. there there's no reasoning. There's no standard in doing that. Yeah. All of these worldviews are vying for your attention. All of these worldviews are vying for your life. All of these worldviews are vying for, for your distraction. They want you to focus on them so that you will not focus on true life. And that's in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 31 and 32. All of these worldviews are not true. All of them can't be true because they're, they're diametrically opposed to each other in the way they work. Only one is absolutely, eternally true. That's the one presented in the Bible. That's the one given to us by God himself because God himself is the only one who knows. We began by talking about the long-lasting influence of Saeed Kutab's dangerous worldview. More than 50 years later, after he was put to death, people all over the world are still being impacted daily because of the constant dangers of terrorist attacks, not only from Al-Qaeda, but other terrorist organizations as well. That's a pretty long-lasting influence. It's a pretty concerning influence. But let me close with an even greater influence that, that we can know. The truth is, that's nothing compared to the influence of a humble Jewish carpenter and teacher who walked this earth more than 2,000 years ago because of, because of his worldview, because of his teaching, because of his ministry, because of his miracles, because of his moral perfection, because of his love, because of his sacrifice, because of his death on the cross, because of his burial, because of his resurrection, because of his future return, our lives are forever changed. Millions upon millions 
have been transformed and we are now called by his name and a part of his family and have a grand hope and a future with him in heaven. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. You want to know how, how influential a worldview can be? Let's watch Judgment Day. Now, praise be to God, we as believers won't have the same judgment day. Uh, we'll uh, bypass that line uh, because of Jesus' grace, because of uh, the forgiveness that he offers us. But those who have refused him, those who reject him, whether they ever wanted to know him or not, whether they ever wanted to live for him or not, doesn't matter. They, too, will stand before him and how to acknowledge that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. That's how influential he is and how influential his worldview was going to be. Let me ask you, are you living by a biblical worldview? And with that said, do you have a high view of Scripture? Do you believe that Scripture is true, 100% true? If not, then you might as well throw it in the trash. Because if there's any part of it that's not true, then how can you pick and choose which is and which is not? If it's not true from page one to the last page, then there is no standard. We're just as lost as the worldviews that we've talked about. God has given us the standard of His Word, and if you're ever sitting under a teacher that tells you that any part of God's Word is not just as influential and authoritative as another part, then walk out the door. Because that's dangerous. That's a worldview that is going to get you in trouble. Because God's Word, through Christ, Holy Spirit, and, and teaching us is, is the way of life. Him in our life teaching us His own worldview. I say that with passion because I see it all over the place. Not necessarily in this church, but I see it all over the place uh, with, with people twisting God's Word to say what they want it to say or denying that parts of it. We're going to talk heavily about this in the next couple of weeks, especially in regards to creation and evolution. If you can't believe the creation event, then you can't believe anything in the Bible because... It's the same God who wrote it. It's the same God who gave it to us. And so that's my challenge for all of us is to dig deep into his word and, to, and to, to believe it, to live it, to hold it with, with all our heart and soul and passion. And this morning, I'm not sure where you are in your faith. My, my hope would be that every single person in this room is already a believer, has already given his or her heart to Jesus. But I would probably be naive to assume that. And so I invite you to search your own heart. Search your life. Just throw out a question to God. Am I, am I right with you or not? And the Holy Spirit will answer that question for you. Are you right with Him? Have you received Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? If, if, if you ask yourself that question, if you ask God that question, and, and you somehow get the feeling that it's not, that the answer is no, then won't you consider receiving Christ today? It'll change your life. It will transform your life. No, all your problems won't necessarily go away, but then you'll have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords walking right there with you to get through those problems and to help you grow through those problems and to give you something to celebrate the victories to celebrate. And so won't you consider that? My guess today is most of us have done that. So my challenge for the rest of us is to, to be a little more disciplined, to be a little more committed, to be a little more intentional about digging into the truths of God's Word and trying to apply them to our everyday lives. And maybe uh, there's some of you who, who, for whatever reasons, don't have a, a church family 
And so I invite you, if, if, if you're looking for a church family, won't you come and be a part of ours? We would love for you to be a part of us. We would love uh, to join with you and all of us growing together in our faith, holding each other accountable and supporting each other and loving on each other and growing together. And so whatever, whatever the Lord lays on your heart during these next few moments as we sing together our hymn of invitation, hymn number 557, People Need the Lord, we're going to sing through it twice. Now, whatever the Lord lays on your heart and however he tells you to respond, won't you respond with faith and obedience? Let's worship him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength this time. 